in a sense, the essence of a travel book is hardship, ordeal, or uh, difficulty. So that's okay. There are plenty of books like that. They have a lot to recommend. I've written them myself, you know, of, of having a tough time. It's much better if, I suppose, if it's flavored with some joy. And there's always joy in travel because there's a lot of freedom in it. And I felt in this book that there was, a, that there was both, but more, more pleasure than pain. Welcome to Deviate with Rolf Potts, where I talk with experts, public figures, and interesting people about fascinating topics that meander off topic. Today, travel writing legend Paul Theroux comes back on the show to talk about his newest book, which happens to be the 56th book, including travel and fiction, that he's published since he began his writing career in the late 1960s. The new book is called On the Plane of Snakes, and it occurs to me that he was in the process of researching this book when I talked to him back in episode 31 of DV8. Mexico is occupying my mind at the moment. I'm not doing much else. I'm concentrating on that. I've traveled for the past two years. I've been there pretty intensively. I studied Spanish. I figured out how to drive there. But it's been very profitable. And um, as I said, I've made a lot of friends there and... uh, it's on people's minds. I mean, uh, President Trump keeps talking about how they're terrible people and, and immigrants are just uh, uh, rapists and they're horrible. And it's a moment to, to reflect on uh, the stereotypes that he's talking about. Someone says, this is a terrible place. Don't go there. It's dangerous. And my feeling is, well, that's the very place you should go. Now, what's remarkable to me about these observations is that he made them just 18 months before his new 400-page travel book on Mexico hit bookstores last month, which underscores just how prolific he is as a travel author. I was actually in Mexico when I read On the Plane of Snakes. Specifically, I was in San Miguel de Allende teaching a travel memoir class. And in quoting the book again and again to my students, I realized how little I actually know about Mexico, as close as it is to my own country. This is something I discuss with Paul Theroux, and he talks about why he seeks the countryside rather than cities when he's trying to get to know a place like Mexico. He talks about what it was like to be a student of Spanish while in Mexico and how that helped him get to know the place. He talks about what it was like to travel Mexico in his 70s and how the perspective of age informs his writing. He talks about meeting Mexican migrants along the border and elsewhere in the country and how their embrace of travel is unique to this part of the world. Paul Theroux and I also talk about the limits of magical realism in literature, the utilitarian logic behind the revolutionaries in Chiapas, and how Mexico brought him a unique sense of personal joy and satisfaction as he traveled from one end of the country to the other. A reminder, if you've been enjoying this podcast, to please subscribe and leave a friendly review at your favorite podcasting service. I always forget to remind people about that, but it's a useful way to help new people find this podcast. But for now, please listen in as Paul Theroux and I talk about the complexities of travel in Mexico. He talked to me by phone from his home in Cape Cod, and we begin by discussing my own recent trip to Mexico. You know, it wasn't until I read your book that I realized how little I know of Mexico. Uh, And I actually read it in Mexico, but... I think it's not uncommon for Americans to experience a, a rather superficial, for lack of a better word, layer of Mexico, even though it's it's right next door. It's a neighbor country. So I'm curious to know why you wrote about Mexico and what you knew about it going in. I, I knew um, about Mexico pretty much what most people know. I had been there a number of times. I visited the museums and the ruins. Uh, I had visited the resorts. I hadn't seen the interior villages. Mexico is not just its famous towns and Mexico City or its resorts. It is mainly the hinterland. I mean, the, so it's a very poor country because most of the people have, um, you know, the per capita income in Chiapas and Oaxaca, as I mentioned in my book, is about $3,500. That's the same as people in Kenya or Bangladesh have. So the, the life of Mexico is lived in the villages and small towns of people just getting by. But Mexicans are frugal, they're industrious, and they send money back. I mean, a lot of people, are, they're remittance uh, migrants. So they make beds and you know clean hotel rooms in Denver and send the money back or they do roofing or pick, whatever it is. 
So it's not as though they're coming to the States to uh, become citizens necessarily. It's a lot of them are just um, trying to, to, to make money to send it back. So the real Mexico, the Mexico, uh, the vibrant Mexico of traditions is really the, the poorer Mexico. I quote in the book how the past of a place survives in its poor. So the poor parts of Mexico are the most historic and the place with the longest memories. That, and that's the real memory. Uh, that's the real Mexico. Well, I noticed that you actually write about these Mexican migrants quite a bit, not just at the border section of the book at the beginning of the book, but also in Oaxaca and other places. You talk about people. I mean, in a sense, you're a traveler, but also these people are travelers or have been travelers. And you, you were in a town where a quarter of the population at any given time is in Poughkeepsie, New York. So Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Did, did you set yeah, up? a town called uh, San Agustin Yatareni. Yeah. Yeah, and that's one thing that surprised me. You know, I think uh, the the stereotypical American image of Mexico is very much a border image. It's uh, dusty places and and um, you know migrants trying to come north. But you talk to people all throughout the country. Was that sort of one of your goals? Was to sort of uh, get into the psychology of the, this traveling class of Mexicans who often ended up in the United States? That was one of the um, reasons. Of course, I wanted to find out why so many Mexicans travel, and the obvious reason is money. Although many um, Mexican writers, intellectuals, people, painters, whatever, um, uh, leave because uh, they want greater exposure, they want, and they, many of them go to Spain, but they, they teach in universities in the States, they, they live in New York, write books, uh, many want to become citizens. So people have all sorts of reasons for, for emigrating. Um, the ones that interested me most are the people who are the most desperate. But if you look at people on the border, I mean, the majority are not Mexicans. The majority of people um, going across the border undocumented are from Central America, fleeing persecution or violence. Mm -hmm. They're from India, Bangladesh. They're from Africa, Nigeria, Congo. They're from China, and some of them have a lot of money. So it's Mexicans are the, are the least of the problem, I think. But I think that also, as I said, the life of Mexico seems to be lived uh, in, in villages and places that are not written about in Mexico. And the reason why you say that some of my book was a revelation is that most Mexican writing is about Mexico City um, or it's, it's about urban life. And it's not about, I mean, there's no William Faulkner in Mexico. There's no Wright Morris. There's no Sinclair Lewis. There's no, no one's writing about the farms, the villages. And I, I shouldn't say no one. There are, there's very, very few that uh, typically uh, a Mexican writer goes to Mexico City and writes about his life or her life there. So it, it, I'm fascinated actually by the texture of life when I, traveled in the south, in my book, Deep South, dri driving around in my car, I was very surprised by how little I knew about Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, and places like that. So I'm interested in sort of the life of the land and less interested in urban life. You take a little bit of issue with the idea of magical realism uh, as, as yeah. sort of this, this fashionable Latin American style of writing, and you say that in a sense... It's just another word for fantasy. So how do you think magical realism has a way of, of maybe shortchanging the repertorial realities of what it's like to live in a place like Mexico? I find most of it fanciful and kind of uninteresting and playful in a boring way. Um, the great magical realists or the great uh, um, fabulists, you might say, are Borges, um, I'd say uh, Garcia Marquez, maybe a couple of others, but uh, for anyone to do it now, I mean, people in, sitting in New York City or in Mexico City and writing magical realism while <laughs> life is going on around them, you know, the, uh, it, it, it is a bit absurd. And yet, when I say that, I was in places where, I mean, I was in a village, uh, you may remember from the book, it's called um, uh, 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 Santa Maria uh, Ictapec, where <laughs> they have a statue uh, a carving of of 
the crucifixion of Jesus um, having fallen, the, the, the third fall, and it actually bleeds. They, it, the, the hair grows on the statue, and hmm. local people say it bleeds. I suppose writing about that, that's a, that's a sort of magical realism. You live in a village where there's uh, these amazing things happen. But I think m- my objection is when it's done uh, mechanically, according to a program, you know, people saying I'm a magical realist. Well, um, there are so many examples of it that, that struck me as that strike me as bogus, particularly in a, in, in a place where there's so much realism, not m- magical realism, but but realism, hyper realism, surrealism almost of uh, of life in Mexico. For example, um, the cartels, the violence of the cartels is so amazingly cruel and so, you know, blindingly um, uh, 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 effective decapitations, uh, dismembering corpses, hanging them from, um, from bridges and so forth. That's not magical realism. That's, that's a sort of hyper-realism that um, you only have to describe uh, uh, and you, you seem to be describing another reality, but you're describing the everyday life of, 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 of say, a border city in most cases. So I, I do, I have a, but my problem isn't so much with magical realism. My problem is with uh, programmatic writing. You know, people who write in stream of consciousness or aff- aff- people, aff- anyone affecting um, a style rather than writing as they are, I suppose. And, they, and this, they're affecting a style that's been used, that's sort of worn out. You, you don't criticize James Joyce for writing in stream of consciousness, but something that bothers me a lot about writing, and particularly travel writing, is a lot of travel writing is written in the present tense. And I'm walking down the street in San Miguel de Allende. I see a man. He smiles at me. Um, he offers me an avocado. I say to him, Buenos dias, senor. He smiles back. That sort of mm. thing. Mm. It doesn't grab me. It doesn't grab me. I, I, I tell when I have students, I say, you know, write, write as plainly as you can. It don't, don't, don't affect a style. Don't draw attention to your style. Style should be transparent. Uh, and subject matter should arise out of, um, yeah, I suppose your experiences. They may, they may be ghostly or, or magical, but... I tend also to think that all writing, all art, is autobiographical, and that um, that when when people are writing about fabulous <laughs> beasts or whatever it is, uh, I don't know, transformation and so forth, that it's not autobi- that they they're, they're kind of avoiding writing about themselves. Do you do you know what I mean? I, I do, yeah, and I think there's almost an, an an ethic that sometimes suggests people should not write about themselves, that they're being more repertorial, somehow more honest if they don't include their own perspective. But in this book, you sort of start with the idea of age, with the idea that who you're traveling as a 76-year-old is probably has different eyes than who you were when you were 38. Um, and so that seemed to be very present in this book, the idea that you are traveling uh, at a very specific age in your life. Uh, yes. Well, I, I, I say in the book how feeling uh, disrespected or ignored um, in the States uh, as a man, as a writer, as a person, as a citizen, just sort of overlooked. You get to a certain age and you, be, you become invisible. Um, that, that sort of irked me. To go to a place where you're respected, your writing, your, your presence, your age is respected – is a very desirable thing, and that's the sort of thing that happens in Mexico. Um, it doesn't happen where I live. It, I mean, I'm in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Now I have no profile here. I'm nobody. I live in Hawaii the rest of the time. Um, it's, uh, I would say, in general, I could put it as kindly as possible, that a place like Hawaii is hostile to the intellect. The, the very fact that you have a brain is sort of held against you, I think. So that's always a problem. And I, and I think um, it's wonderful and, and, and a revelation when um, you're, you're treated, I mean, in my 
um, my late seventies, and um, I think I should I should be accorded a measure of respect. But I'm not saying I'm standing on my dignity. I'm just saying that that's one of the um, advantages of traveling in Mexico is that the language is respectful. There's formal language, ustedes and tú. So that's that's a good thing. No no one is going to call me in the in this over familiar way. And the other thing is that that Mexican writing, most of which is not translated into English, is extensive. So you go there and you meet writers and read books that um, that don't that, that don't travel outside of Mexico. Painting and music too, a lot of vit- virtuoso. So it's not a place of necessarily just sombreros and mariachi music. There's plenty of string quartets, there's great painters, there's great sculptors, and there's wonderful writers. So the the Mexico that I experienced was both the Mexico of the migrant, of poverty, but also a Mexico of high culture. And uh, that was very satisfying. I I loved being there. And although I had my ups and downs with the police, um, I really found it a, um, a very enlightening trip to take. And the book, it was really one of the, one of the um, most satisfying trips I've taken to the extent where I would gladly go back you know, and write, a, write another <laughs> a sequel if I had a chance. I really got that sense that, that I've read a number of your books, especially your travel books, and there, there was a very overt reflection on joy in this book, that there was a lot of moments it was clear that you were enjoying. Yeah, I think that's... That, and there's a, there's a type of travel book which is strictly about having a bad time. You know that. I mean, in fact, a lot of it, a lot of it. In a sense, the essence of a travel book is hardship or or, or ordeal or uh, difficulty. So that's okay. There are plenty of books like that. They, uh, they have a lot to recommend. I've written them myself, you know, of, of having a tough time. Um, the, it, it's, it's much better, if I suppose, if it's flavored with some joy. And there's always joy in travel because there's a lot of freedom in it. And I felt um, in this book that there was a, that there was both, but more more pleasure than pain. We've talked a little bit about books here, and I was uh, impressed by how many books inform your book. I mean, you have a lot of repertorial books about the border situation, for example. You draw on a lot of, uh, you know, American or at least English language writers who visited in the past, like Kerouac or, or Huxley uh, or Lawrence. And then also there's, there's very much a meditation on these Mexican writers and how sometimes they might favor a, an international sensibility or m- sort of a Mexico City-centric sensibility more so than a, than a rural one that has a little bit more reality. And and you 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 commented on how you can't just be the the person in their study reading the book that that actually driving across across Mexico also informs your journey. But how much did the, this reading frame your expectations and your conclusions about Mexico? That's an interesting observation and question. Uh, I should say that I started life um, in a I would say lower middle class family in Medford. And the pleasure that I had in life was at the library. I was, I began life as a reader, not a book buyer. Um, we couldn't afford to buy books. I didn't probably buy a book until I was 18, 19 years old. Till I was in college, probably. I, I don't remember buying books when I was in high school, but I remember spending a lot of time in the library. And in a way, uh, reading made me a traveler and reading also made me a writer. So, so reading has informed most of my activity. I read all the time. I mean, I, I always have a, a book on the go. And Mexico cannot be understood um, just on its own. You can't go there, look at it, eat tacos, talk to people and think that you have any grasp of it. You really need to read the literature of Mexico, the literature of travel, the lit- uh, Mexican literature itself, history and so forth. And I think that my understanding came from um, talking to writers and certainly reading. And there's some amazingly good books written by Mexicans about Mexico and by foreigners about Mexico. The, 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 you mentioned Huxley and Lawrence. I mean, the, the, those are two uh, distinguished writers of Benton, but there's Rebecca West, Harriet Dorr, Leonore Carrington, women and men um, 
all the way up from the earliest time to the present. Because Mexico is is a sunny place, it's, it's a warm and hospitable place. A lot of a lot of writers go there, American and European. Um, one is uh, ben, Bruno Traven, B. Traven, who wrote The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. He also wrote a lot of books about Chiapas, remote places in Chiapas, where he traveled in the 1920s. He's a mysterious figure, Traven, but you learn a lot about Mexico from reading his books. Um, and so I felt I couldn't write anything about traveling in Mexico until I was well informed. And I was probably, um, I did probably more reading uh, about Mexico or, or for this trip than I have done uh, perhaps for other trip, maybe because there's more written about it. But I also think that I wrote, a, uh, I compiled an anthology of uh, travel called The Tao of Travel, came out a few years ago. For The Tao of Travel, I wrote, I read 350, 400 books and, you know, read them myself, copied out passages from them, typed them, put them in the book. I don't have a secretary. I don't have graduate students or anything like that. So I did it all myself. But I found it was a great pleasure at reading those books and compiling this anthology, The, the Tower of Travel. It's, it's it. So talking to me about reading is <laughs> it, you, 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 you strike a chord because I think that reading has been one of the joys of my life um, and the pleasures of solitude. I also think that if people don't read, um, I'm happy to talk to anyone, you know. But if you t- if I talk to someone who actually reads, I have a much more um, uh, a much livelier conversation. I mean, you can really strike up a friendship, a great friendship, with people who uh, who read the books that, that you read, or, or people who are recommending books. And I'm talking about real books, not not, uh, I don't know, the, the, the necessarily the bestsellers or the current books, but to meet someone, uh, I'll give an example, uh, Nathaniel Philbrick, who lives in Nantucket, and I see him occasionally, hmm. is kind of an authority on Moby Dick. I love talking to Nathaniel Philbrick about Moby Dick. Uh, as far as Mexico, I met um, lots of people who traveled there. They've written books about it. Um, I, I, I love talking to them. Because a writer tends to notice things that other people uh, don't notice, and they're noticing it so they can write about it. So they're more obser- more observant, and they have better memories for what they're doing. You know, you you talk about reading as being one of the joys of life, and I really caught a lot of joy from teaching your Mexican students in Mexico City. And then, if not pure joy, you were also a student, uh, and you also had. An embrace of being a 76-year-old student who's studying uh, Mexican Spanish in Oaxaca. So yeah. how, how did both of those experiences deepen your experience of Mexico? I think really um, one of the most intense experiences you can have in a country is being a teacher. Because you, you're, uh, you have students in your classroom, you're talking to them, they're talking to you, and you have all this response. So I had a group of 25 or 30 students. There were 30 actually altogether, but um, 25 with five uh, observers. And I was talking to them all the time. So I was full of questions, but they had questions too. So you, you, it's a way of having 30 friends and they're local and they're all different. They're, you know, different um, uh, from different walks of life. All of them were writers in my class. Um, And so the intensity of that is just, um, uh, very, very enlightening, and and it's pleasurable. Being a student is is also um, an amazing experience. Studying a language in the country. What I found studying the language was how much you give a, give of yourself. There's something about language study which is very revealing of yourself. People are constantly asking you questions about. In order to to create a dialogue. They say, what food do you like? What's your family like? Uh, what was your father's name? Where were you born? How old are you? And you find yourself delivering your, your, your autobiography 
to the class, you know, what sports do you like? What do you like to do? Um, and uh, I found that kind of exhausting and and amazing in its way because I had noticed it before how much you give. But that that's uh, as a teacher, I learned a lot from the students. As a student, I suppose they found out a lot about me, but then I also found out a lot about them, and I learned the language. So those were two, teaching and studying were two uh, very, very useful experiences. And, uh, you know, I would recommend it to anyone. If you, you want to uh, get to know a country, be a teacher. I was a Peace Corps volunteer, so I was a teacher in Africa, and uh, that was a formative experience in my life. I noticed that the questions that come out of a second language conversation, like when you were learning Mexican Spanish, are sort of revelatory. I mean, you've written I, more than 50 books now, yet yeah. I didn't realize until you were sharing your Spanish class conversation that you worked in a supermarket, which is very relatable because I worked at a supermarket when I was very young, or that you yeah. have tattoos, that there, there's somehow um, <laughs> yeah. this this uh, this Spanish class level sort of, it, it, it takes maybe some of the presumption out of these very basic conversations and hence you have very basic answers in a way that might not be normal to even an interview like the one we're having now. No, that's true. Uh, that's true. And, and the, the other aspect of it is you're in a class with other people. There was one um, women, woman was a lawyer. Um, another one was a uh, Japanese, um, I think she was an architect. There were, there were two other college students and there was a 13-year-old girl and you know, others, it, it was just uh, um, a, a very ill-assorted or uh, an assorted group. Maybe not ill-assorted, but they're from all different different walks of life. And so they had a lot to say, too. But that's, um, it's true, yeah. And so, it's, so I've, I've, I found that I was uh, giving a lot away, but I didn't mind. I mean, but they, to tell you the truth, they, they didn't know who I was or that I wrote books. And they weren't particularly impressed by fact that I was a writer. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that, that was fine with me. It was, I would rather be anonymous than be the well-known writer in the room. Yeah, you know, when, when it came in the part of the book where you were first teaching and later a student, it sort of felt like an or, a more organic take on the country, sort of more of a relaxed in relationship with Mexico than you see on the border. And and just since this is going to be, since the border is such an issue these days, uh, I'm curious to know what your take home was during your 2,000 mile road trip along the border, in part because I got the impression that it delivered a kind of realism to our American sensibility. I mean, when they had that big caravan issue uh, traveling up last year, um, there was a lot of very uh, humane responses that I saw on social media, but they were also a little bit sentimental. I just got the impression that being around the border makes you realize that it's not as simple as a human interest story, that, that um, you know, the, the, the border is seen as this, uh, as this negative place sometimes, but we can't just open it up and let everybody in. What did, what did you learn during your journey on the border that might help bring nuance to, to the way that we as Americans, and especially as sort of progressive Americans, might understand the border? The first thing is that the border um, is, is not a solid line. It's not a, it's not, it's not a wall. It's a place where every day, every morning, Mexicans come over to work, or uh, Americans, United States citizens, go across the border to do business. Um, Mexicans also come over to shop. So hundreds of thousands of people cross the border every day with visas or passports and, and carry on their lives. And, and if the border were sealed, if they didn't cross, um, they, they'd, they'd suffocate or die. It, 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 um, it, it's, it's not simple at all. And so when you talk about closing the border, I mean, that's, that's, that, that would shut off all the oxygen. It would kill business. It would, it would be terrible. I also think that it's not a, a good thing for people to be swimming across, walking across the desert, risking starvation and thirst, um, or, you know, climbing over the fence. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, okay with that. I think a border needs to be policed. It is, after all, a border. And the reason it's a border is to, to be regulated. So 
I'm not an open border person. Um, but I do think that uh, I'm a humane person, and I realize that a lot of people who arrive at at the border or at uh, at, at, at the cities at the border um, need to be taken seriously, and their and their stories have to add up, and they 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 need to be um, protected, and um, I suppose. Um, interrogated to the point where you find out are, are they legitimate um, migrants so that should they be allowed in or not I don't think that um, that that people showing up at the border have a right of entry I've traveled in my whole life I've been traveling uh, since 1963 when I for the first time I went to Africa I've never felt I had uh, an absolute right to enter any country, and I've all, always been stopped by immigration and asked. I lived for England for 17 years. I went for 17 years when, <laughs> whenever I got to the airport. Um, they looked at my passport, and I didn't have a right to work there for many years. I, I was there um, because my wife was English. But um, so you're always reminded that you're an alien when you, uh, or that, that you're not a citizen when you come to a border. But the idea that, uh, in the case of many Chinese migrants, you could call them, um, they might give fifty thousand dollars to a cartel member to go through a tunnel, uh, or under, uh, or over a fence, or in a boat, or whatever, to, to enter the country that way. I call that Ill illegal entry. I mean, you would wonder, should it, it's happened sometimes a dozen Chinese paying huge amounts of money to cartels come across. So what what rights should they be granted? Should they be given uh, sanctuary, you know, go to a sanctuary city, guy with a lot of money, Indians, Pakistanis, Afghans, Syrians, Nigerians, whatever. I mean, there there's a whole category called special interest aliens. And you might say, um, are, are they in the same category as a person from rural Mexico who's got nothing but who's coming across to work to 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 pick fruit or to fix a roof or something and intends to go back it's a it's a much more complex and uh then then it's a much more complex um uh, situation than than is generally recognized and when people make speeches about it the let them all in speech or the open borders speech or uh, I don't know, the decriminalized speech, whatever it is. I, I listen very carefully because I realize most of these people don't know what they're talking about. One thing I noticed that the border sort of has a face far south of the border. And uh, for example, when you're in Oaxaca, you're talking to people who speak almost, I guess they've traveled into the United States sometimes decades before. It sort of gives them status in their home village. Uh, they describe their travel stories uh, more in more detail than their actual being in the United States stories, yet they sort of have an affection for the United States, which even as difficult as it is, is sometimes an easier life or a more uh, a richer monetarily life than, than down in places like Oaxaca. You also use the phrase, this is the oddest frontier I've ever seen, which is interesting since you write about frontiers a lot. Uh, so what dynamic makes this place so unique and how is there is there any way to to differentiate between the kinds of of migration and and even smuggling that comes across that border? The uniqueness of the border is that on one side there's a country where uh, the per capita income is extremely low, and the other side of the border, you know, ten feet away, you know, uh, just through the door of the fence is a country where the per capita income is huge. So the, the, the different, I, I don't know, uh, another place, maybe between Russia and China, maybe between, um, I don't, I can't think of another country. I mean, if, 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 uh, if Japan was part of the mainland, maybe, you know, it would be Japan and Vietnam or something like that. But, but in general, the disparity in income and achievement, uh, or, or, you know, or financial success is so great between the United States and Mexico that it's, it's this um, 
huge disparity um, that 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 invites people. It's a you know wealth is a magnet, um, prosperity is a magnet. You, a person coming from a place where there's a leaky roof and um, and uh, you know no school and uh, no medical facilities, something like that. It comes to a country where this, these are available. Or you might say where there's work. Now, there's work in Mexico, but it's very, very poorly paid. Even the NAFTA companies are pathetic. I, you know, that, that's a big con on the whole. So I've been through, you know, across the border between Kenya and Uganda. I've walked across that border. I've walked across Ethiopia and Kenya. Between, I, I went across from China, Vietnam, that many, many borders. Burma and, and Thailand, uh, India and Pakistan. I've been across. But when you go across, although there's a difference and probably different language and um, a different culture, still you're not going to this dramatic, this dramatically different economic situation. And that's the situation that exists. So it's a temptation. It's people looking through a fence and seeing life um, that's immeasurably better. And it even draws people from Africa and, and, and from other countries because it's a border. It's not hard to get to Mexico. And once you get to Mexico, you go to the border. So um, it's a, you know, it's a, uh, it's as though we're living in a gated community called the United States. And outside the gate is, um, uh, g generally speaking, poverty and neglect. And that, uh, that's, that, that uh, draws people to the border. But I'm not, judging the border. What I was trying to do was just describe the border. You know, I'm, it's not a political book, but when so many people are talking about, um, not just Donald Trump, but many people talk about immigration and borders and, 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 the, and the border as it is. Uh, I thought, I want to see it for myself. And that's, I could say, the reason for most of my travel. I've been traveling for more than 50 years, and it's always about, I want to see it for myself. You talk about the disparity that really reveals itself in such a stunning way on the border of the United States and Mexico, but you also talk about disparities within Mexico itself, and, and late in the book, uh, you actually have an interaction with the man known as Subcomandante Marcos, and yes. that's another part of Mexico that Americans sort of understand through, a, I think I read about it in the headlines many years ago sort of way, but I was really impressed by uh, his reasoning and, uh, and just sort of by the logic and history of that movement and how it serves the people of that part of Mexico. So since since people, including my listeners, might not completely understand that situation, what's what's the logic in some subcomandante Marcos's argument uh, for this kind of resistance against not just the government, but a kind of neoliberal flattening of the world? The main objection it came about because the Mexican government was was pushing people off the land. There's a type of common land where people farm or live called an ejido, e j i d o ejido. So an ejido, um, they were taking uh, the ejidos away from people so that they could um, uh, dig for minerals or or cut timber, just or just removing people from the land because they wanted it from the cell to, to, to build to build houses. But this is the, the land was, it was common land. It was, the land had never been sold or bought. It was just land, it was traditional land. So, there, so land tenure was, was quite a big deal um, in, in, in the Zapatista movement. But the Zapatistas went into the jungle in Chiapas in 1981. Uh, Marcos went in 83. So, uh, they emerged significantly from the jungle and declared um, that Zapatistas taking over in 1994. So they had been there quite a few years, much longer than, let's say, um, Castro had been in the mountains before taking over uh, Cuba and, 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 and overthrowing Batista. So the, the Zapatistas understood the, the, the economic and cultural situation much better than most revolutionaries do. And they're humane. They're, they're kind of postmodern revolutionaries. They weren't going around 
uh, killing civilians like the IRA, which was, is killing civilians, or ETA in Spain, killing civilians. I mean, there were movements in India and uh, and all over the place, really, that that kill civilians. They they Afghanistan, bombing people in mosques and so forth. That's not done. Um, they 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 wanted to take over for the for the good of people, and not start a war. They um, the the Mexican government resisted. They they um, they bombed them and they. Uh, Fought them, but um, it 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 became a standoff. And the Zapatistas, you know, since 1994, however long that is, the Zapatistas are still more or less um, in charge of a lot of social services in Chiapas, schools, clinics, villages. They have model villages and whatnot. And you know, compared to places on the border, they're they're magnificent. I mean, they're they're humane. They they. Uh, there are plenty of schools. There's 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 plenty of opportunities for people. Much more than you would find in Juarez or Reynosa, where there are where the um, the NAFTA factories are. And Marco subjected to NAFTA the way a lot of people did, seeing it as not only uh, exploitation but also um, exporting a lot of GMO crops that are putting people out of business. So. Or, you know, ruining their livelihood. I I had a lot of admiration for them. I have admiration for people who make sacrifices, for people who have uh, ideals, and people who act on it. And even though it's very inconvenient for them to do that, so um, they, I expressed an interest. They welcomed me. I spoke to um, to their group, um, and and it was a, a a very a very enlightening and. Um, a really uh, a vitalizing moment for me to see them as friends and to be welcomed. And I would gladly and intend, I, I got to go back and I would uh, intend to, to go back and see it. But the situation is not simple. They're seen as revolutionaries, guys wear, and women wearing masks. But uh, they, they just don't want to be victimized by the government. So they're, they're still masked and um, highly articulate, Marcos and the others are very good writers, and uh, uh, I loved being with them. And I see that that was an aspect of Mexico that is hidden from most people. But um, for me, it was it was one of the high points of my trip. I thought one interesting detail you brought up in in describing that movement is the idea of patience, especially as contrasted to someone like Che Guevara, who was who was very high profile in his own historical way, but yet went into Africa without really understanding the Africans he was working with very well. And you bring in an interesting comparison to NGOs. I mean, you know, it's it's good to act on our ideals, but it's one thing to rush in on our ideals and another thing to to go in slowly and listen. Uh, and and That's so true. so what. Uh, even even for NGOs or some future iteration of uh, of of NGOs, what might what is happening in Chiapas teach us about how to act on our ideals in a way that is actually effective? Most NGOs working in say Africa, in my experience, don't know diddly squat about the places that they're living in. They don't speak the language. They haven't lived there long. They're just parachuting in handing out food to people or giving money to, to, to people or whatever, building something. And they really have no notion of, um, of the kind of lives that people are living. So that's my objection against, there's a lot of celebrity, um, uh, celebrity do-gooders come very high on that list. And then there's ones that just, they're, they're, you know, an NGO or a lot of aid agencies are businesses. They are businesses and they thrive on catastrophes, what uh, uh, famine, or floods, whatever it is, that really energizes them because they can collect a lot of money on the, on the basis of it. The 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 thing about um, uh, the Zapatistas and others, I mean, I'm not saying they're all like that, but the the best features of a an NGO or, or an aid agency is one with patience um, and 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 understanding, and one that's spending a lot of time. I spent six years in Africa, and it wasn't till I was in Africa a long, you know, a couple of years, maybe two or three years, living in a village, uh, teaching, getting to know people, speaking the language, that I really began to understand what people wanted, what the, and and more of what they needed. And so, a lot of aid that's given is 
is um, corrupts people. I mean, I think that's a given, but um, it doesn't it doesn't get where it's supposed to get. And a lot of it's self-serving too. You know, it's to make you look uh, like you care. Uh, and also, it's I suppose is a tax advantage to it. But so all of that is is a recommendation. But um, uh, I, I I can't say that I understand everything about Mexico. But the the, the book is an accurate reflection of two years of, of traveling in my own car, driving around the back roads of Mexico and, and making friends. You know, I talked to you maybe eight years ago and you said that you were interested in going to Angola and Mexico and Greenland. And then the last time I talked to you, you were actually writing your Mexico book. And so I guess the question is, um, is Greenland on your map right now? And if not, what's next for you? Keeping in mind that you were inspired by uh, a rather young, semi ninety-six year old, while you're in Chiapas, and you see have a lot of adventures left. I'd love to go to to Greenland. I not not to write a book, just to see it. Uh, I love being home. You know, I love being home. Uh, and I'm a novelist. I think of myself as a novelist rather than a travel writer. I do travel a lot. So uh, there there are lots of places. I like return journeys. I like to go back uh, after many years and see what happened to a place. Because if you just, if you see the um, the past of a place often informs the future. I'd like to go back to uh, where I was a teacher in Africa. I'd like to see Japan again. I, I like going to India a lot. So there's many, many places. But especially, it's enjoyable and enlightening to be in a place where you speak the language. And I liked being in Mexico and improving my Spanish. And so the idea of going to another Spanish-speaking country would be would be fun. Uh, you know, we, 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 we don't have a lot of time on this earth. So you got to, when you get to my age, you got to use it wisely. And the thing that, um, I object to most is people wasting my time, you know? This has been Deviate with Rolf Potts. More about everything that was just mentioned, including links to Paul Theroux's new Mexico book on the Plain of Snakes, can be found in the show notes at rolfpotts.com slash deviate. And of course, if you have questions or insights, please feel free to share them with me by email at deviate at rolfpotts.com. This episode was produced by Justin Glow. Cedar Van Tassel does the theme music. Jan Futterman does the show notes. Thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in for future episodes of Deviate with Rolf Potts. Deviate with Rolf Potts.